A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. You have also forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as children. My son, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as his sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet later, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet, that what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one be deprived of the grace of God, that no bitter root spring up and cause trouble through which many may become defiled. Verbum Domini. The Lord's kindness is everlasting to those who fear him. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all my being, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. But the kindness of the Lord is from eternity, to eternity toward those who fear him, and his justice towards children's children, among those who keep his covenant. With you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, 
the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, are not his, his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not known without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we commemorate the Jesuit St. Paul Miki and his companions, the holy martyrs from Nagasaki, Japan, who gave their lives for the faith at the end of the 16th century. The Gospel recalls something less dramatic, but nevertheless also unpleasant, something that Jesus himself experienced in his hometown in Nazareth. There he was met with curiosity and with disbelief. This is something that we priests often experience. It's difficult for us to preach when among the congregation there are members of our family and friends. And it's even more difficult to say something important and spiritually nourishing to those who are close to us and who remember us in our youth. We as if instinctively hear their comment. Yes, yes, we remember you. We remember when you were a child, when you were ignorant and uneducated. Who are you to speak to us in this way? Jesus came to his hometown, where he was known. People lived not only within a minuscule family, but within a clan. That was an extended family. All the relatives lived close by and had common memories. Their proximity and clan ties were such that they called themselves brothers and sisters because they supported one another, giving them social strength against the challenges of life. People were not as isolated as we often are today because they had these relationships. But their memory their way of doing things, of interpreting the world around them, was also common. This was a source of strength, but it also locked their minds. It was difficult, very difficult, to break out of this closed world. And so when Jesus came to his hometown, he was met with intriguing curiosity, because news of his public mission his teaching and miracles had reached Nazareth, but he was also met with disbelief. What Jesus, Jesus was doing, who he was, his claim that he is the Son sent by the Eternal Father, did not fit into the closed minds of the family clan. The mystery that Jesus, the incarnate Word, was revealing was scanned through the ideas, perceptions, and limited worldview of the locals. Their ideas were a barrier against the divine mystery that had been disclosed in Jesus. We read that he could work no miracles there, only a few healing of the sick. Jesus always awaited an active, lively faith. Faith has the power to break through human concepts and it opens the mind to the divine mystery. We encounter God in faith and so when we accept the mystery, when we engage with it, we become receptive to the workings of divine grace. Faith always entails a moment of surprise, a recognition that God is in charge and things can turn out in surprising ways, completely beyond our imagination and concepts. As we live out our lives in faith, 
we allow ourselves to be surprised and drawn along ways that we have never imagined, never planned in our lives. One of the surprising things that happen in the spiritual life as we are led by God is the steady purification of the soul. We ourselves do at times perceive that things are not going well, that we should change. We make examinations of conscience and we actively try to improve. But often little comes out of our good intentions and decisions to improve. What is far more important are the purifications that God himself engineers in our lives. And as we are led by God, we encounter difficulties that force us to open up our souls, our hearts, our minds, our lives to the accompanying power of God. The letter to the Hebrews that we read reminds us of this today. Like a good father who reprimands, corrects, and sometimes punishes a child, but always in view of the child's good, so the Heavenly Father leads us through difficult moments that force an interior conversion in some sphere of our life. The reading that we read began with the perplexing line, in the fight against sin, you have not yet had to keep fighting to the point of death. This is a warning, and even more an invitation, to continue in the struggle against sin. It's not an invitation to undertake the task on the basis of our own moral strength, our own willpower and emotional force. It's an invitation to engage in the struggle against sin within a faith-centered trust in the power of grace. Unfortunately, it sometimes happens that we give up. There are people who stop struggling, who conclude that they are just made that way, that they have some specific weakness and they're happy with it, and in fact they cease to treat it as a weakness. They even start thinking and claiming that this is their specific way of being and nothing can be done about this. It's true that we have some weaknesses that accompany us for many, many years. They are the effects of original sin and of our own sins. Committed sins generate a wound in the soul. They facilitate the repeating of the same sin all over again. These difficulties are left by God for our struggle. The Apostle tells us today that we are not to give up the struggle, but that struggle has to be seen as a gift coming from the Lord, who, like a good father, wants us to engage in the struggle, to invite his grace, to relate to him within the context of our struggles and our difficulties. Furthermore, God reprimands us and leads us not only through the struggle with internal sin, God is also nudging us along through external difficulties, through illnesses, personal and social dramas, and sometimes even God is leading chosen souls through the pain and witness of martyrdom. Not all Christians are called to martyrdom, but in all periods of history of the church, including our own, there have been martyrs, witnesses to the faith, like St. Paul Miki and the martyrs of Japan. All unpleasant events, big and small, that befall us are a divine help so that on a deeper way we will engage with God. But for this to happen, we need to open up our minds and accept the divine hand in the events that befall upon us. They are a help in our conversion. We are not to lock ourselves in our preconceptions like the people of Nazareth, thereby excluding God. In the past, people lived in a greater proximity with God. People were dependent upon God as they awaited the sun and the rain that would benefit the crops. 
they suffered illnesses and prayed for cures. Today, we seem to be more independent from God. And many people live for decades, having excluded God from their minds, projects, and even their struggles. But God has responded to this by extending the length of life. Now people live longer. And often those who have lived without God spend many, many years of their old life alone, forgotten, in hospitals and care homes, wondering what is the sense of their life. This is a blessed time given by God when all other projects and hopes are spent. It is a time given so as to learn how to be a child before God.